Welcome everyone. I'm Molly Brown from the Heartland Telehealth Resource Center. We're glad you're joining us today for the HTRC Education Series focused on telehealth, billing, coding, policy, and licensure. Just a few notes. This session is being recorded and we will share it with you afterwards. Your microphones have been muted, so please use the chat to ask questions as we tend to have a large group during these sessions. If you would like a completion certificate, please contact us at htrc at kumc.edu, and we will put our email address in the chat, so keep your eye on that. So let's get started. I'd like to introduce our speakers for today. First, Rochelle Marting is an attorney, registered health information administrator, and certified coder who focuses on healthcare coding, billing, and reimbursement issues. She has served as an in-house outpatient multi-specialty surgery coder, hospital-based outpatient coder, and a compliance coordinator for a large multi-specialty medical group. Rochelle is also the acting director of managed care contracting for North Kansas City Hospital and Meritas Health Corporation. She serves on the American Health Information Management Association Policy and Advocacy Com Committee, American Hospital Association Payer Accountability Work Group, and American College of Physician Advisors Government Advocacy Committee, where she acts as liaison between the provider community and policymakers on topics including telehealth. I'd also like to introduce Diane Belquist. Diane is an attorney with Joseph Hollander and Kraft LLC. Diane's experience working for government agencies includes the Kansas Board of Healing Arts, and in her practice, she defends licensed individuals and entities before their respective regulatory boards. Her regulatory defense practice includes appealing application denials, responding in investigations of complaints, and petitioning for judicial review of agency actions. I will turn it over to Rochelle, and then we will be uh, hearing from Diane um, towards the middle of our webinar. Right. Thank you, Molly. Well, as always, uh, the proposed rule for the Medicare physician fee schedule um, on what we anticipate we might see as policy changes, coding changes, payment changes for 2025 released in July is full of telehealth policy. And in the next several months, I think we're gonna to continue to see different updates in telehealth policy at both a state and a primarily a national level. We'll talk about what's in the proposed rule under the Medicare Physician Fee Schedule with respect to telehealth, some new proposed services, new codes, new benefits for enhanced care management that have not been available to providers to, um, to bill previously, uh, some behavioral health services as well. These are similar to care management services, but they have an emphasis on mental and behavioral health issues. And then some policies that relate directly to rural health centers and FQHC coverage and billing. Um, so Diane put this um, great graphic together that I think really illustrates the intersection of some of the topics Diane will talk about from a licensure perspective, privacy rules, drug enforcement administration, how that interrelates with prescribing medications, with privacy, with payment, with policy, and with um, licensure issues, as well as malpractice. So keep in mind this graphic as we're talking about coding and payment policies, and as we shift gears to Diane's presentation on some of the, the risk areas, the malpractice and the licensure issues, and that circle in the middle on where all of these topics intersect. I also wanna remind everybody on the session that even though these are the proposed policies, um, some of which pertain directly to telehealth for 2025, that prior to the proposed rule being released every year in July, there is a February deadline that providers need to be aware of where you can request additions to or changes in the list of covered telehealth services from Medicare. I've got the link here, the deadline, February 10th of 2025, maybe one to mark on your calendars, especially as we go through what may be changing in the covered telehealth list for next year. Anything you submit by February 10th does not get considered for the 2025 coverage year, it would be considered for 2026. So it's really important um, if you have coverage requests to communicate those to CMS. So I wanna go through the first um, category, of course, the, the, the biggest one for Heartland Telehealth Resource Center and the folks joining on the call most likely is, is telehealth. Just broadly, 
changes in coverage for telehealth and how policies may be evolving for 2025, where the final deadline for some of our PHE flexibilities that got extended through December 31st of 2024 may be expiring at the end of the year. And so we'll get a sense of the direction that CMS may be taking with respect to some of those policies. Now, I'm going to start first with just the list of covered telehealth services. And interestingly, CMS did not propose any new services to be added to the list of, of permanent telehealth services from what are currently provisional or temporarily covered telehealth services. The only two codes that are being proposed for addition are actually new codes for 2025. Um, for individual counseling related to um, HIV risk infection. Um, actually, there's one code that is being proposed to come off of the telehealth list. This is not something we see very often um, when we're talking about the list of covered telehealth services. It tends to expand, uh, not decrease. So this was a little bit unusual. Radiation Treatment Management Code 77427 has been on the list of covered telehealth through the duration of the public health emergency uh, and, and is being proposed to permanently take it off effective January 1 of 2025. That's a code your providers use. You may want to take a look at that proposal see whether and how that impacts you and consider if, if your organizations may want to comment or provide feedback to CMS on that removal. Now, there are several codes that CMS, while they're not proposing get added to the list on a permanent basis, would bring into the list of covered telehealth services on a provisional basis. Provisional status is a relatively new category for Medicare telehealth policy, and it's sort of a holding area where codes can be covered, CMS can examine the, the safety, the efficacy, the utilization patterns as telehealth services before deciding whether to make those codes available as permanently eligible telehealth services. Home INR monitoring and several different caregiver training CPT codes are proposed to go onto the list that would be newly eligible to provide as telehealth, but not necessarily on a permanent basis yet. Some good news for telehealth policy, I think, would make several flexibilities that we had during the public health emergency for the provision of telehealth services to patients in institutional settings available without frequency limits. There were frequency limits for subsequent hospital visits rendered via telehealth prior to the PHE. There were frequency limits for subsequent nursing facility visits delivered via telehealth prior to the public health emergency. Those were relaxed, they were waived during the public health emergency and they returned in recent years. But now CMS is re-examining those limits and proposing to eliminate them entirely for subsequent hospital visits. And I, I should have clarified, I put subsequent inpatient visits, but now that's inpatient or outpatient or observation hospital visits subsequent nursing facility visits, and critical care consultation services. Right now for hospital services, subsequent hospital visits, there's a frequency limit of once every three days that those services could be rendered via telehealth. In the nursing facility setting, there's a limit of once every 14 days. CMS is proposing to eliminate the limits entirely. In theory, that means um, providers could deliver subsequent hospital or nursing facility visits via telehealth on a daily basis. There are some proposals to change the definition of what constitutes a telecommunication system. Now, when I'm looking at the proposed rule, I'm always thinking about what areas of telehealth policy the Department of Health and Human Services and CMS have the authority to change as an agency through rulemaking versus what has to happen through a literal act of Congress in the Social Security Act? There are many pieces like the definition of an originating site, um, the definitions of distant site providers, 
that has to happen through an act of Congress. But how a, a telecommunication system is defined, two-way, live, audio, visual, real-time telecommunications technology, Health and Human Services and CMS has the discretion as an agency to frame that definition. So this is something that they can modify what services can be delivered via audio only or when services need audio and visual. These are proposals that would happen on a permanent basis in Medicare regulations if they are finalized. And I should emphasize again, everything in this presentation right now with respect to reimbursement these are proposals. These have not been finalized yet. Um, we will find out in November after a comment period and CMS consideration whether and how these proposals are, are finalized for 2025. So one of those changes in the definition is that a telecommunication system for telehealth services under the Medicare program could include audio only to a patient who is at home. Now, I think this is really interesting because I just said that CMS doesn't have the authority to change the definition of eligible originating sites. That is defined by the Social Security Act. That is set by Congress. And in the Social Security Act, home is not typically an eligible originating site for Medicare telehealth services. That has been a broadened flexibility through the public health emergency that has gotten extended several times. This suggested to me that there may be federal legislation in the works that may pass before the end of the year that could allow the patient's home to be a permanently eligible originating site for telehealth services. Otherwise, this particular bullet item would never, would never come to fruition January 1 if the ability to deliver telehealth to patients at home went away at that time. So just keep in mind that may signal um, good news in terms of potential legislation coming towards the end of the year. Now that ability to deliver telehealth in an audio only format when a patient is at home under the Medicare program has some conditions to it. That's if the distant site provider would be able to use video, audio and video, but the patient is not able to join by video um, or the patient doesn't consent to using video. That might mean they don't have sufficient internet bandwidth. That may mean they're having technical difficulties. It may mean the patient just doesn't want to turn video on. In those circumstances, Medicare would permit the telehealth service for all telehealth visits after January 1, 2025 to be delivered as audio only. FQHCs, RHCs, there are modifiers um, to, that you can use, a modifier FQ that you can use to indicate an audio only service. All other providers would use a modifier 93 to signal to CMS that that was an audio only telehealth service. There's also some, I think, good news and some clarifications with respect to provider enrollment. This is a topic that also came up during the public health emergency when we had providers who had to quarantine at home and not come into the clinic setting in order to avoid reduced exposure um, if they had been exposed to the COVID-19 virus, if they had signs or symptoms and wanted to, to help control the spread of infection. Providers may may have been well enough to conduct telehealth visits from home or from another location. The question arose then, did those providers need to enroll their home as a practice location to be identified on a claim form when those telehealth services were billed? During the public health emergency, CMS waived that requirement that generally would apply if you are regularly providing services from a location to enroll it and to identify that location, that address on claims. When the PAG was, ended, was ending, CMS had identified some concerns that providers communicated with enrolling their address, uh, not the least of which is their home address potentially becoming publicly available information 
under the Medicare program. So CMS has continued to delay and extend the flexibility, allowing providers who currently deliver telehealth services from home or another location on a, on a regular or frequent basis uh, to not have to enroll that home location. Uh, and then can, they can instead use their regular practice location as the site of service when billing. That's to help um, as CMS kind of examines the, the potential um, provider safety and privacy issues surrounding the enrollment of home addresses. Some other proposals that might be uh, that on the table to consider as permanent changes in telehealth policy that I think are, are make a lot of common sense and will make things a lot easier um, are extending the ability to use virtual presence as a way to satisfy direct supervision for certain services. So direct supervision um, means under the Medicare program that the provider, the supervising provider has to be in the office suite and immediately available to intervene to provide assistance during a service. That may make a lot of sense during, um, during minor procedures or services where there's a risk to the patient and they are physically in-person services. But Medicare um, realized that in the telehealth context, that didn't make a lot of sense to require the provider and maybe nursing staff to be in the office suite um, physically present uh, to intervene. So virtual presence was created during the PHE to say, as long as that supervising provider is available to immediately intervene during the telehealth session, that was called virtual presence. And that could satisfy direct supervision requirements anywhere that's required under Medicare policy, like incident to billing. Now CMS is proposing to permanently extend that concept of virtual presence to 99211, an evaluation and management service for established patients that generally is delivered by clinical or auxiliary personnel anyways. So what CMS is looking at here, there are certain codes like 99211 and a, a list of other services that are almost exclusively provided by clinical or auxiliary personnel and not the billing practitioner personally. And CMS is saying in those instances, we generally think it is appropriate for virtual presence to satisfy direct supervision for incident to billing without requiring the billing provider to be physically in the office suite when the service is being rendered. Now, the other category of services, but besides 99211, it gets a little bit technical. If you were to download Medicare's RVU spreadsheet, the RBRVS spreadsheet that's released by CMS quarterly, there is a column on that spreadsheet called a PCTC indicator, Professional Component Technical Component Indicator. If you were to filter that spreadsheet where the professional technical component indicator is five, that's identified. That I indicator identifies services that are typically performed by clinical or auxiliary personnel. And CMS says, we think that's another appropriate classification to say any codes with that indicator could also have virtual presence satisfy direct supervision for incident to billing. So it's good news in a way, but it's also a pretty complicated mechanism um, to, to operationalize. Now, when we send the slides out after the session, I'll have four or five slides that list all of those CPT codes that currently have a PCTC indicator of five. So you can take a look at what those, at what those are. Now, another telehealth policy that could be extended um, in 2025, it relates to teaching physicians and the requirement that they have to be available during a key portion of the service. And CMS would potentially make permanent the ability for teaching physicians to be virtually present to satisfy that requirement. But there's a little bit of a twist on this compared to, if I back up one slide, virtual presence for direct supervision for incident to services. 
The twist is that for teaching providers, rather than just being available to join the telehealth session um, or, or in-person session for that matter, virtual presence means they have to actually join the evaluation and management or other service for a key portion of that service. They actually have to, to attend a portion of the visit. They can do that virtually. They, Medicare uses the same phrase, but it has a little bit different meaning in the teaching physician supervision concept. So I'm gonna shift gears and talk about some new um, enhanced care management services. And I know I'm going through this really quickly, but um, I'll, I have slides that we can send out after the session as well that really dive into a little bit more detail on the requirements for these services. Over the last several years, CMS continues to try to, to recognize different ways that care is managed outside of an in-person or a face-to-face -face or telehealth services, things that are happening in between actual encounters between provider and patient. And there's a category called care management services that encompasses things like transitional care management, chronic care management, um, and, and those things that are going on behind the scenes that are not really face-to-face. -face. And this year, CMS would add to that list um, something called advanced primary care management. This is a care delivery model that is actually sort of a comprehensive package of a lot of individual care management services. Things like um, communication, technology-based services, virtual check-ins to see if a patient needs to come in for a visit, um, all kind of wrapped up into one care delivery model that could be billed with a single comprehensive monthly care management code. And when we break down what makes up or what comprises the advanced primary care management bundled serve, monthly bundled service now, um, it will fall under the care management category, which means anything that falls under the care management category, Medicare allows what's called general supervision instead of direct supervision. Direct supervision, again, it requires the provider to be in the office suite immediately available, or if certain policies get finalized, that could mean virtual presence with the ability to intervene during the session. General supervision, though, is just more broadly without having to be in a certain physical location. The provider supervises and has overall responsibility for the services that are being delivered. That also allows providers to use outside resources um, to kind of make programs scalable if they don't have the in-house resources to carry out some of these specific items that make up the advanced primary care model. So in, in looking at who could potentially deliver and report advanced primary care, CMS is really looking for the provider that represents the continuing focal point for all needed healthcare services, the one that's responsible for really for the primary care role for that patient. Now that sounds a lot like a new code that was released in 2024, G2211, which recognizes the inherent complexity of that provider who is the continuing focal point for all needed healthcare services. G2211, that's an add-on code for your office visit and your other evaluation and management services. But there's a twist. For advanced primary care management, it doesn't have the exact same definition as the providers that could report G2211. The difference is G2211 also recognizes that certain specialists, maybe who don't fill that broader primary care, general um, care management role, but have, a, have a, a role as a specialist for the ongoing care related to specific conditions like cardiology, like infectious disease, and have an ongoing longstanding relationship with the patient. Could report G2211, but would not be eligible to report advanced 
primary care management services. Only one provider could bill for advanced primary care per patient per calendar month. Um, this could be a physician, nurse practitioner, really any um, qualified healthcare practitioner that can bill for services that fulfills um, the, the definition of a continuing focal point and delivers all of the items that comprise this service. So CMS, of course, anticipates the code will primarily be used by the primary care specialties, primary medicine, family medicine, maybe internal medicine. I put the codes on the screen. I won't read them in detail, but bolded a couple of key portions for you. One thing to note though, there is no time element to these the way there are with many other care management services today, like chronic care management, requiring um, at least uh, a certain number of minutes of care in a calendar month. And instead of focusing on time, CMS says, as long as the, the requirements of these services are delivered in a calendar month, then the code could be reported. So that's a distinction with these new codes. Um, the G, P, C, M that you see, one, two, and three, those are just placeholders for now. If uh, the proposal is finalized, to make this a benefit that is billable and payable under Medicare, they will be assigned HICS PICS codes that we'll see in the final rule in November. And just to give you a sense of how CMS proposes to value these services, um, I, was, I was a little bit surprised at the payment rate, um, especially for what they're calling a level one advanced primary care um, management model. There are a ton of requirements to deliver this service and to have a national payment rate at about $10, I think when you take a look at that bulleted list, a lot of providers are going to find it challenging to carry out those services for $10 a month per patient. Uh, and that's for patient with one chronic condition. Two or more chronic conditions is $50 a month. And then there's a third category for Qualify, QMBs, Qualified Medicare Beneficiaries, who um, essentially are dual eligible um, members with multiple chronic conditions for $110 a month. Now, another piece I want to mention, all care management services require the patient's consent and patient cost sharing applies. That may be another barrier to um, delivering those services effectively because patients may not want to be financially responsible for uh, their, their patient responsibility for those services. So you have to get consent and, and particularly that the patient recognizes that there's financial responsibility and agrees still to participate in that program. So I wanna shift gears a little bit to similarly um, care management type services, but really focusing on mental and behavioral health issues. And again, most of these are services that may not necessarily be direct face-to-face -face services. They're not classified as telehealth per se, because a telehealth visit um, under Medicare's definition replaces what would typically be an in-person visit. Care management services and, and these um, behavioral and mental health services don't necessarily take place typically in person. And so they, they feel a little bit like telehealth. They just don't fall under the telehealth benefit for Medicare. That doesn't mean they have to be delivered in person, though. So Medicare has identified a number of new categories of services that could be billed for mental behavioral health issues. There's something called safety planning interventions. Um, really, if you think of those that provide mental behavioral health services, if you're familiar with psychotherapy or crisis codes um, from the medicine section of CPT, the valuation for safety planning interventions crosswalks to those crisis intervention codes that currently exist. A post-discharge telephone follow-up with a patient, um, digital mental health treatment, and then interprofessional consults. And again, there's so much detail that we could go into on these services. I will provide 
um, more information in the slides that we hand out after the session. But for high level overview on what these services are, safety planning interventions, they would be an add on code, a, a hex fix code. And it would be billed with either evaluation and management services, or it could be billed with psychotherapy services codes when safety planning interventions are personally performed by the billing provider. So very much like um, psychotherapy and, and crisis intervention codes that currently exist. You can kind of see what that code would look like. And again, this GSP I1, that's just a placeholder for now. If this were finalized as a code and a benefit that would be payable next year, we would get um, a, a formal new HICS fix code to describe the services. Um, so we assist the patient with recognizing warning signs of potential crisis, um, talking about coping strategies, working with caregivers, family members, you know, other social resources, making the environment safe. Um, so it's reported as an add-on code with e and and psychotherapy. Now, this next code looks and feels a lot like transitional care management that already exists in the sense that this is a follow-up from a facility stay um, for patients with mental behavioral health issues and a specific set of protocols post-discharge to follow up with the patient and have contacts with the patient in conjunction with the patient leaving um, the emergency department for some sort of mental behavioral health encounter. Um, these services would be a bundle and the protocols are described in more detail in the, in the proposed rule, but in those protocol, it's not just one contact after discharge, it's a series of about four calls within a month after discharge from the facility, each call lasting anywhere from 10 to 20 minutes. This code, if finalized, um, this service could be billed regardless of whether uh, a, a um, if I go back, safety planning intervention was also performed for the same patient. Now, that means they often will be performed together and both billed for the same patient, but they do not have to be. To, to bill for these post-discharge telephone follow-up contacts with a patient throughout the month following an emergency department visit where there might be mental behavioral issues at play, there's at least one real-time, live, not a voicemail, telephone interaction with the patient. And here's a point of clarification. CMS says unsuccessful attempts to reach the patient do not qualify. There must actually be contact. Cost sharing applies so that we have to have patient consent to bill for this service. Next are digital, um, sorry, got ahead of myself, digital mental health treatment services. Think of the evolution of remote patient monitoring, remote therapeutic monitoring, specific to mental and behavioral health. That's essentially what this benefit or what this code would represent. So these are furnished incident to professional mental behavioral health services um, for ongoing care in between encounters. Patients are using devices, and I have this phrase cleared by the FDA. That stood out to me because under remote physiologic monitoring currently, under remote therapeutic monitoring currently, the rules don't require a, a device that is cleared by the FDA. They only require you're using a device that meets the FDA definition of a medical device, um, which is an extremely broad definition and pretty easy to meet. So that stood out to me. And I don't know if that was intentional or if with public comment, CMS may clarify that they didn't mean FDA clearance as a device, but they intended to align with existing policy. It just meets the definition of a medical device. So we'll have to monitor that in the final rule. 
Uh, the three codes listed here, um, I'll let you read these after the session, but they model very closely. They align with how remote physiologic monitoring and remote therapeutic monitoring works. There is an initial practice expense code for the supply of the device. There's the teaching of how to use the equipment. There is um, the monthly management of the patients and the data, the information that's being reported back related to mental behavioral health conditions and how that impacts their plan of care. And then lastly, interprofessional consults uh, that are billed related to mental behavioral health conditions. Um, the code that would be used for these services is based on the amount of time during the interprofessional consult whether um, a, a written, whether a verbal consult's provided or only a written consult. And again, I'll, I'll, I'm just listing the codes out here so you can kind of see how they're structured. It's just a hierarchy based on the extent of time, five to 10 minutes, 11 to 20, 20, 20 21 to 30, excuse me, in those various interprofessional consults. Ones that require, let me go back a slide, excuse me, um, verbal and written report, versus um, not requiring the extent of the same um, uh, verbal report, but a written report only. And lastly, before I turn it over to um, Diane, policies specific to rural health provide rural health centers, excuse me, and federally qualified health centers. Um, uh, telehealth was a big focus in this policy as what in this area of the rule, as was care management services. Now, 2024 had several changes to the way rural health centers, FQHCs, bill and are paid, the amount particular that they are paid for care management. So outside of your all-inclusive rate or your PPS rate, depending on whether you're RHC or FQHC, CMS has been developing a list of care management services. And regardless of whether it's transitional care management, chronic care management, um, this year, we had remote physiologic monitoring added as a, as a care management service. The, there was one code that was reported, G0511. And regardless of which specific care management service an RHC or FQHC provided, they could be paid extra outside of the all-inclusive rate, outside of the PPS rate, but it was one number. And the one number was a weighted average of the, the allowable amount for an individual care management service and how often they were being billed. And then CMS kind of established a single weighted average to say, this is what we will pay for G0511. That's changing. And instead, CMS still wants RHCs and FQHCs to be able to separately report care management services and be paid separately for them beyond the all-inclusive rate and the PPS rate. But CMS wants to allow RHCs and FQHCs to report the individual codes that describe the specific care management service being provided and be paid the allowable for those specific services. So that allows RHCs and FQHCs to potentially be paid more money for those higher valued care management services than what they're being paid today. So that would be a little bit of a change in the RHCs and FQHCs would have to learn the individual coding for those care management services, identify which care management service and report the right code on the claim form rather than always just billing G0511. Um, advanced primary care management if finalized as a benefit, um, is proposed to also be added as a care management service for RHCs and FQHCs for separate payment. Along the same lines for RHCs and FQHCs, CMS would like to maintain virtual presence as a way to satisfy direct supervision for incident to services, not on a permanent basis, but at least through December 31st, 2025. So we're kind of kicking the can another year while CMS uh, presumably assesses whether they want to make that flexibility permanent or if they're gonna pull that back and actually require in the office suite and immediately available 
to satisfy direct supervision for incident two. Now, one thing I think is interesting in CMS's proposed rule, CMS says they would maintain RHCs and FQHCs as eligible distance site telehealth providers and billers through 2025. But if I go back to the beginning of the presentation, I said there are certain things CMS can't do as an agency um, that Congress has to establish and set. And this is one of them. The eligible distance site providers who can bill for telehealth under the Medicare program lives in the Social Security Act. It requires an act of Congress to make this flexibility possible. So again, I think that signals that we may see legislation over the next couple of months to take effect in 2025, potentially extending the ability of RHCs and FQHCs to be eligible distance site providers of telehealth, either on a permanent basis or at least for another year. Um, we can build telehealth services with a Hicks fix code on the claim when we are the distant site provider for those services. And CMS would delay the in-person visit requirement for certain mental health services furnished by RHCs and FQHCs via telehealth for another year. There are some preventive service policies specific to RHCs and FQHCs. Um, really that allows them to separately bill for um, certain vaccines and be paid for them separately. I'll leave the details on the payment rate, the last two bullets on the slides here for you to review later to understand um, the, the payment amount, but good news in the sense that RHCs and FQHCs can uh, potentially bill and receive separate payment for not just the vaccine um, substance that's being administered, but also the administration code itself, separate from the all-inclusive rate and the PPS rates. Something I think they'll really want to pay attention to as a revenue opportunity um, to make sure that they're capturing if that proposed rule is finalized. So with that, Molly, I'm going to um, pass it back to you and uh, let Diane take it over. Thank you. Before, but every time I listen to your presentation, I'm just in awe at the amount of depth of knowledge you have in this very complex area. And so I certainly appreciate you allowing me to piggyback um, some of the licensure components onto this presentation in light of that, um, you know, organization with that chart that you had shown at the beginning. There's telehealth presents a very multifaceted, multi layered. Um, analysis for compliance and to be able to be sufficiently reimbursed, which is the one of the most utmost important things is being able to get paid for the services, right? So as Molly's pulling up my I'm slide trying. here, no, you're fine. Um, I'm just going to keep rolling and then the slides are going to um, appear here as soon as she can get those up. So one of the first things that I just wanted to touch base on is provide a DEA update. So as you may be aware, DEA and HHS had done some flexibilities in cooperative effort with respect to the Ryan Height Act uh, in allowing telehealth providers to prescribe controlled substances without that in-person requirement that otherwise under the act would be required. And so that has been extended through December 31st, 2024. Um, I've provided the link for the regulation that offers that flexibility. And just to key you in that there may be permanent regulations coming this fall. So um, stay tuned. I don't have any more specific date or time frame for you other than fall of 2024 anticipated, but stay tuned because there might be changes coming on that um, one way or the other. Either that's going to potentially come to an end or perhaps, um, in my opinion, the better outcome would be if it was extended to continue that flexibility. Um, next slide. And then in the multifaceted analysis involving telehealth issues, the other aspect is malpractice insurance. I just thought this was um, an appropriate time to drive home, of course, evaluate your telehealth 
um, practices with your malpractice insurance to make sure that your malpractice insurance carrier is apprised of the full scope of practice via telehealth. Um, sometimes it is automatically covered by the policy. Sometimes it requires a supplemental coverage. And so, of course, licensure is going to be required for the malpractice to be covered. So, again, it's an intertwined, interdependent relationship. Um, it also provides maybe a checks and balances. If you're inquiring with a malpractice insurer, there's also going to be an analysis on their end to make sure that there's that um, licensure there. So, next slide. Just as a recap, I've given a presentation before on licensure with respect to telehealth and practicing um, in more than one state, but I'll, this is a recap of the different pathways to licensure to be able to provide um, services across state lines. Of course, single state licenses is the old traditional way of doing business as we're all familiar with. Um, telehealth waivers, they came into play primarily to accommodate for COVID-19. Many states um, discontinued that after the pandemic ended. So there's a few states that have continued that on as a permanent base, but I say more often than not, those waivers have gone by the wayside. Um, then of course, there's the compact licensure for different healthcare professionals. And those compact um, laws are intended to allow for a broader practice accommodating telehealth, of course, across state lines. Those compacts are getting expanded year over year and becoming um, more widely adopted and more accepted, so making it easier for licensees. And of course, then we also have certain state exemptions that can, this is state by state, of course, but it can maybe limit the practice type or scope or provide exemptions to licensure altogether. Um, next slide. Okay, let's talk about the telehealth waivers first. This is a snippet from the FSMB. I guess the FSMB attribution got caught off there at the bottom, but um, that's where this was obtained from. If you're not familiar, the Federation of State Medical Boards website contains a wealth of resources. And so I would encourage you to consult that website if you come across a licensure issue, which you have questions about. It's likely that they will have information that can help at least point you in the right direction to finding an answer, if nothing else. So with regard to the registration or waiver, I'm gonna focus in on that line here. So of course you can see 10 states, and this was last updated in February of 2024. So as of February, 2024, there were 10 remaining states that have continued to have registration or waivers for telehealth specifically. So something less than having to apply for um, a full license. What is entailed to obtain that registration or waiver in each state is again, state dependent. In Kansas, because Kansas does have a permanent registration, you have to file certain information with the board. You have to have a license in our state that has similar standards to Kansas. It can, it must be unencumbered. Um, but those are the basic elements. And then if you apply for that waiver, it's granted within a very quick, short turnaround. And it's not with the FBI fingerprints and the licensure verification process that you would normally encompass with a full-fledged application for a medical license. So with the FSMB's registration or waiver, those 10 states, what I did then was I went out to verify which of those 10 states have that waiver. As you can see, Kansas is in our Midwest region. We don't see Missouri or Oklahoma having that process. But I've listed there for you the other states, which um, could be potentially helpful for providers. Uh, okay, next slide. Now the physician compact, this has expanded currently to 40 states, um, Alabama, Connecticut, and Vermont. They pose some different challenges in that physicians are not able to obtain principal state licensure through those three states, Alabama, Connecticut, and Vermont. Um, so they have to enter in through a different compact state license. Then they can get a compact license in those three states, but that cannot be the originating 
first compact license state. So there's just an asterisk with those three states, but otherwise you can see that the interstate medical licensure compact is sweeping across the nation. Um, there's Missouri was added within this last year and Florida was recently added too. So they're in the process of implementing that legislation, not entirely fully up and running yet. But then we'll have Kansas, Missouri, and Oklahoma as um, as far as within our Midwest region here with having adopted the physician compact. Notably, um, California has not been has not adopted legislation or even introduced legislation to enter the compact. And so I'll talk a little bit about California as we continue to go forward. Next slide. Um, this is the nursing license compact. So the nursing license compact has 42 states. So it's tracking pretty similar with wide sweeping adoption, such as the medical side. Um, there were no additional states added in 2024. There were several added in 2023. So I I don't know what to take away from the 2024 stall out. I would, my gut tells me that it's probably just um, a one-off year and next year we'll probably continue to see more widespread adoption and additional states get added on. Um, seven states do have introduced legislation. So it's just a matter of getting those seven states to adopt the legislation and then implement. Notably, California is the one state that has not introduced and of course not adopted legislation. So again, we're seeing a trend with California not partaking in the compact licensure state, which California is a large state. Um, of course, keep that in your mind when providers are wanting to do telehealth in California, they're going to have to get a single state license in order to do that compliantly. Um, next slide. The APRN compact is brand new. There's only three states that have enacted legislation to sign on, but they need seven states before it can become activated. So of course, Kansas, Missouri, Oklahoma are not members yet. Um, I would anticipate that in future years, we're going to see more adoption of this since this is the trend in moving forward with the type of compacts. Um, and then next slide, especially if the PA compact is any indication of allowing mid-levels to have compact licenses. This um, act was activated on April 5th of this year after it had 12 states. Adopted. So the APRN compact only needs seven. PA needed 12. That's just the difference in how the legislation was written. But the PA has the 12 states. And so now it's that compact is going to be working towards implementing it. And it does take about 12 to 18 months to implement, the, implement that. Um, we're going to probably see Oklahoma as the first state in our Midwest region. And then stay tuned to see if there's any legislation in this. 2025 session adopted for either Kansas or Missouri. Even if those states did adopt the legislation, just keep in mind due to the delay of implementation, we're not looking until 2026 at the earliest before it would actually become implemented in these states. And the next slide. And then the PT licensure, 38 states. Um, this also includes PTAs. And as you can see, Kansas, Missouri, and Oklahoma are all members. So the PT compact is strong in the Midwest. Next slide. And then you can compare it to the OT compacts, lagging behind the PT compact with 30 states, but it is continually adding states each year. Um, it also includes OTAs as well. So OTAs also have the ability to compact. Next slide. Speech and audiology, 31 states. And this only became operational in 2023. And it has Kansas, Missouri, and Oklahoma are all members. So as you can see, this is the trend for states. I think once they've gotten a few compacts through, I think this is going to be an easier way forward in order to get additional legislation to have additional 
um, allied healthcare complex and expanding states with the medical and the nursing complex. And as you can see, California, and none of these charts, California is not partaking in any of these compacts. I tried to find an answer. I am in completely intrigued as to why not, but um, I don't know why California is not. And stay tuned. If I hear of the reasoning or the rationale, and I'll update you if I'm giving a different presentation in the future on this. Next slide. And then the SIPAC um, is broadly adopted in 42 states, continually adding multiple states year over year. And so um, again, California, not part of it though. Next slide. So I did wanna bring to light some licensure quandaries that have been identified now that telehealth has been you know, in operation for over the last several years, especially with more modern practices changing. So here's a couple of case examples. Um, one is with specific regard to patients emailing their primary care physician when maybe they're not situated in the state where they normally reside and where they would normally see their PCP and where their PCP is licensed. Um, there are that this is a huge gaping hole in the laws and the laws need to be modernized to address this typical practice of that mode of communication between patients and providers. Most of the laws take into account the virtual office visits, but that's only one part of telehealth. There's also the other types of communications that routinely occur. And this is the second case example goes to the remote monitoring. And this dovetails nicely with what Rochelle was talking about. We have CMS now allowing billable charges for in the mental health arena, post-discharge phone follow-up. But what if that patient is across state lines, that provider is within Missouri, patient was seen and treated in Missouri, and now that patient resides over Kansas side of the state line. And what if that provider is not licensed in Kansas or doesn't have a compact license or telehealth waiver? So that's where this gets, again, dicey with regard to making sure that the compliance is on every level. And same thing with the mental health behavioral remote monitoring that is now proposed to be um, have that billable charge. We don't have clear guidance on is remote monitoring gathered in another state considered to be telehealth, even though it's not that virtual um, and it may be asynchronous. Next slide. So this is a chart by, again, FSMB, and it, it's a bit misleading on space, but nonetheless, it's still helpful just for our future reference. You still have to look at the state's telehealth definition and laws, and then look at any applicable exemptions, but Missouri and Kansas here do have exemptions for consultations only. Um, Missouri is blue, suggesting that it's broader. I've looked at the actual law. <laughs> I don't think that it, I read it the same way. So um, that's where it's important to review the law and review the definitions um, when the issues come up to make sure that um, you're considering the specific factual set in comparison to the law. But Kansas and Missouri are offering flexibilities as a minimum for physicians outside of their respective states to have limited consultations with physicians in Kansas and Missouri and not have to have the requisite licensure for practicing medicine. Um, next slide. And actually, we're running out of time here, and I don't know if, Molly, if you have any closing remarks that you wanted to make. The information about the HIPAA updates that I had included in here can always be sent out through the slides, and attendees can review the information in that format, as I want to be respectful for everyone's time. Getting my technology figured out. Um, yes, and I appreciate you being aware of the time. As I said in the chat, we had a lot of information to, ch to share. We will be doing what we usually do, and we will be sending out a recording of the uh, presentation. We will be sending out the presentation itself, and we've also captured every question in the chat. 
We will create one of our handouts that has the answers to your questions, and we will include that with our follow-up email. Give us a little time so that we can make sure we answer each question um, to its fullest. So we will be reaching out to both Diane and Rochelle to make sure we get those taken care of for you. We greatly appreciate you attending and supporting the HTRC and our education partners, and we hope to see you um, next time.